but oh. all right, awesome. Well, let's get started. Hello and welcome everybody to the Startup Studios podcast with Raj and Seth. How you doing, bro? My man, what's the word? Ah, chill, man. It was a good weekend. I am super, super excited to introduce our next guest, Ravi Karnani, who I met very randomly, actually, in San Francisco about maybe six or seven years ago. Turns out that Ravi and his sister, uh, Srini, who is also going to be uh, a guest in the future, it were roommates of my sister in San Francisco. And I, being you know, the bro entrepreneur, oftentimes, whenever I used to have meetings in the city, I used to have to go crash on my sister's couch. And I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Ravi and his sister back then. But just following along their, their uh, entrepreneurship journeys, and right now we're going to be focusing on Ravi, but in general, that dynamic was something which I think for myself, right, like seeing um, for, for an older brother or just a brother in general and being able to work with my sister was fascinating to see. So I'm super excited to have you, Ravi. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm also very excited to introduce my boy, Raj, um, who, uh, Raj, do you want to introduce yourself, bro? Yeah, Robbie, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, unfortunately, most people know. So I started my career at, at, in the banking sector, you know, um, energy investment banking and left there, cobbled together a few shekels and uh, ran a hedge fund for about 12 years. Had a small exit from that, had a lot of fun. We, we grew to about four institutional funds, um, had my cathartic experience of being a dad and then kind of moved into Seattle and, and tried to be a tech entrepreneur. So have some fun companies that we're building there and some SaaS side marketplaces, but super excited to meet you, Ravi. And kind of what Seth was saying, like, I donkey punch my brother and my sister. Like, I cannot <laughs> believe it. But it's so, and it's such an interesting paradigm because there's that juxtaposition of like some of them, like I'm jumping out of a window or they're like that. And yeah. they're just boom, boom, boom. So it'd be really, I'm really keen to know. And yeah. the pointers and the tips to like, hey, here's an efficiency model that, once you know your sibling does this, kick them out of the room or something like that type of thing. Yeah, 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 for sure. More than more than happy to dig into that. All right, sweet. Well, yeah. actually, with, with that being said, let's just dive right in. Who is Ravi Karani? Yeah, so who is who is Ravi Karani? Um, my story starts out um, in Southern California. And so my my parents were, you know, immigrants from, from India. Um, usual, usual immigrant story. You know, they came here with $20, between 20 and $40. I forget, you know, I think the more wealthier ones had 40, the ones that were not so good had 20. Um, my dad's always 17. So he, he's under there. See, that's us. I told you there, there's always this like under $50 sort of number. A flex. Exactly. Um, and so they, they came here to the United States. Um, my dad, interestingly enough, actually got a, got a master's in chemistry in, in India, um, and obviously, you know, as it was in the kind of 80s and 90s, it was really tough for immigrants to find jobs. And so he um, basically started off as as a pool boy, right? He was driving a pickup truck, um, going to people's pools down in sunny, sunny Southern California, um, cleaning pools, doing acid washes, installing pumps, you know, anything around anything around pools. And um, the story goes that he obviously would go to these pool stores, right, to pick up chemicals. And uh, the guys like stepped out for lunch or something, and he started doing... Um, water test, right? People bring in their, their water samples to, to get their pool water tested. And when the owners came back, they were talking to that customer, you know, one or two weeks later. And they were like, who the heck was that dude that was doing our water chemistry? Because the amount of knowledge that that guy had was absolutely crazy. And they were like, dude, what the, what the heck do you know about like water chemistry? My dad's like, well, I'm actually a master's in chemistry. And they're like, you need to get out of that pickup truck and get here in the pool store. Um, and so, you know, as does immigrant stories go, he ended up opening up a pool store. We had 30 pool stores back in the day. And that's how I grew up. That's how me and Shrina actually grew up. My mom used to put us in a stroller. Um, my mom did, you know, finance. She did all the receipts, made sure we had, you know, the money in the bank. Um, and then my dad went on to basically building out the pool store business. And so at a very early age, both me and my sisters used to stand on a little step stool behind, you know, the counter and I was, you know, back in the day with the little credit card machine, punching in people's numbers and making sure I was, you know, properly putting in how much they're paying for chlorine, um, learn the learn the art of stocking, right? You want to make sure all the labels on the chemicals are facing forward, um, had a pricing gun, used to price all of the chemicals until I eventually actually um, got to owning my own pool store, which was one of my dad's. I ran it at Huntington Beach um, and also was a pool boy myself, right? So that's kind of that was like the uh, very, very early years of uh, of me and me and Trina growing up in um, Riverside. Oh, that's amazing. 
And so, uh, well, how old were both of you? Or, uh, well, we're focusing on you for this uh, episode. So how old were you when, like, you kind of felt being not full-time, but, like, you were involved with the family business? I think I think this is like the child labor problem, right? You know, I think I think legally I should say I wasn't full time up until I was what what's the age like 16, but I think by the end of by the age of 9, 8 or 9, um I was pretty much doing a lot of like, you know, back office stuff. I was doing, you know, I wasn't obviously loading up chemicals and running my own pool route at the age of 8, but you know, I I I very much was kind of helping my dad, you know, Take money, put them in the cash register. You know, stock stock the products on the on the thing. Robbie, clean the you need to step your game up. Uh, I I know as as <laughs> you an put Indian the books kid, and then you do it. Yeah, as an Indian kid, I should have been running my own pool route when I was six. Right? That's that's on, that's man. the problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you don't, you're a failure. Automatically. I'm a failure. Wow, exactly. I was about to say, get the. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. So, well, you're you're doing this. You're, you're a young kid. What were kind of the initial aspirations, right? Because as as uh, we're all um, kids of immigrants here, and growing up with that kind of pressure is very different if uh, you don't really have it. So you're studying as well. There's probably also a lot of pressure for you to stay focused on school. But then at the same time, you see your parents working so hard to give you guys a life and this business that is you know, all through the ups and downs. Where's your head at at the stage? It's it's challenging, right? Because you want to be out, right? You see all your friends going on summer vacations. You see them all playing, you know, after school, and it's like, man, I gotta I gotta go home and like or go to the store and you know clean the floor. It's like, why why can't I take my bike out to the jumps and you know go go hang out? Um, and so you know, I I think it was more frustration than any sort of aspiration. Like if if I really look back on it, I don't think it was like me at the age of you know twelve or thirteen or even sixteen being like. Hey, my dad has a pool store. Maybe I want to go into opening up a retail store or how does this work into e-commerce? Those thoughts weren't in my head, right? I was just thinking about like, how do I hang out with my friends longer? That's that's more of what I wanted to do. And were you successful in that at all? Or was it just all focused on work? Man, I, I think as as like immigrant kids or first or second generation immigrant kids, all of us probably have a similar story. You learn to live with like a dual life, right? You you, you have your life at school. And you, you know, you have girlfriends and stuff that you're not supposed to have. You're not supposed to bring them home. But then like at home, you're this, you know, a plus student, you're bringing in the grades. And it's like, you almost live this kind of duality um, when you do grow up in kind of an immigrant family. And you see this, see this meme on TikTok all the time, right? Or like Instagram, there's always these kids that are like gen zero or gen one kids um, that like live this dual life. No, oh, absolutely. So, well, you're, you're still in Huntington at this point, or, or you you were in Huntington when you started your store. What age were you at that point? Um, I was probably like in senior year of high school, and then I kind of ran that through college. So like, like 17, 18-ish, um, and then all throughout college, I basically ran that store until I was like, you know, 23, 22, 23. Nice. And uh, so you went to high school in Huntington. Um, where'd you go to college? Um, I ended up going to college to UC Riverside. Um, so it's a small university of California out in the desert. And, um, you know, as, as, as again, as, as immigrants, um, I have, I have three, three aspirations, right? I can either be a doctor, I can be an engineer, or I can be a lawyer. Um, and so I, I initially wanted to be a doctor actually, um, coming out of, coming out of high school. And I, I did a stint in the emergency room, um, motorcycle versus trucker guy comes in and man, the, the, the blood, like the guy, the way that he was like, just, I still remember looking at him. It's like, I don't think I want to be a doctor, right. Is, is the decision I made that time. The, the first group that was walking by after that was a, was a mechanical engineering group. Um, and that checked off box number two, right. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a doctor. So I'm going to be an engineer. And uh, that's, that's the group I ended up going with. And I ended up getting a mechanical engineering degree out of, uh, out of UC Riverside. Uh, that it's kind of it's funny how it parallels myself because we I had the same options I chose mechanical engineering because well I thankfully loved cars so I was like okay I can weasel my way into getting into automotive and then 2008 the motor the the entire industry crashes I'm like okay what well, tech was was nicer at that point yeah um, even uh, so Raj uh, he he didn't mention this but he grew up with the entire family of doctors law immense pressure to also become a doctor. He started off that way as well, and they switched entirely to finance, much yep. to the to the um, disappointment. Not of disowned family. for a bit, but you know that's life. Yeah, yeah. 
I think we we've all been diso disowned in one way or another at some point. <laughs> until you until you came back with your with your with your hedge fund exit, but then your exit still wasn't like ten times what it should have been. So like you know, honestly, Rob, was that know, paying resident, you know, paying siblings rents and stuff, and then you know, I think our PKUM was a billion eight, but our exit was a billion two. We were like at like eight hundred at this point, and my my mom calls me up and she's like. Hey Raj, like I can't leave work. The plumber's at the rental house. Can you go open the door? And I was like, "Yes, ma'am." Like that was it. That was it. Eight years into my hedge fund, there's this plumber. The toilet's leaking. Can you, you know, put down the the thing that you're playing on? And okay, yeah, yes, mom. At thirty, yes, mom. Yeah. <laughs> Robbie, I got to ask though. So this duality, which I love. It gave you a little double-edged sword. There were some advantages. For my own edification and poops and giggles, how did the store do compared to your dad, compared to Ravi in college? Um, I mean, it was- He won't, he won't, he's not gonna listen, I promise. Well, it was, it was actually tough running the store, right? Because going to college and then also managing that store um, was just tough with like, with like running an engineering curriculum. So honestly, I mean, I think my, my dad's store was, was doing better. Um, in the grand scheme of things, he had, he had like, I don't know, 20 or 22 stores himself. And then I, I had my one. And so, you know, granted he'd been doing this for, for a decent amount of time. So he was definitely much better, but, um, the Huntington beach store in general just had a, had a higher playing clientele, right? So mm -hmm. overall my, like my, my average ticket volume was a lot higher. Um, yeah. than like his general stores, but you know, I right. think that was just a factor of me being in Huntington Beach versus in in the desert in Riverside. I had to ask yeah. generational feuds. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but what I I said no. So there's also a a bridge in our tech understanding, right, between ours and our dads. Like, so my dad, mechanical engineer, he was a bigger nerd than I was. So you know, constantly fidgeting around. I'm sure your parents were too. Like, did you try to was there any friction between you and your dad on how to run the store and then, you know, like uh, things like sales, marketing, back office? And then... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Like, I think I remember a distinct experience, right? Indian Indian dad wants to save money on air conditioner, right, is the <laughs> is the headline. Um, we're, we're in the desert in the middle of California, right? And like my dad also, I think, just generally runs warm um, or he, he runs cold, so he just wants it to be warmer. <laughs> Um, the store I think once was like, I don't know, 78, 80, something like that. So it was, it was, it was hot inside of the actual store. And I would just notice when I was standing at the cash register that people would be like, like they'd be, be sweating because they came from outside. It wasn't a difference of temperature in the store. And so they were just like, I need to get back into my car. And I remember having this conversation. I'm like, look, I think people are leaving and we can get them to spend more time and money in the store if we just make it cooler. And we had this big argument. He's like, oh, did you know that's so many dollars per kilowatt hour? And if I do this and that, and if I bring the temperature down to 72, I'm like, look, let's just try it for like a weekend when we have our rush and just see if it increases traffic. And, you know, after that, we, he started keeping the store freezing cold at some point in time. But like, that was like a, you know, that was, that was an example that I remember of us kind of having this, uh, this like generational dad versus son difference. Um, well, so you're in college. Obviously, working on this on store. So was... I, I just want to throw the, the bomb of great user feedback loop on that one. <laughs> Listen, dude, I, I'm sorry. That's yeah. brilliant. Well, you gotta add data to your argument, right? Come exactly. On, and I was and I was running the cash register, right? I was I was there interfacing with people at You're the point of purchase. It. And so I I, I I was talking to them. So in a oh. 10-minute ROI versus a, an hour-long ROI in the in a in a pool store, radically different. Yeah, yeah, entirely. So when when you're studying engineering, you're at Riverside, you're running the store. Was that like at, at that time, right? Because you're you're in this weird space as a, a young adult who's trying to figure out what you want to do in the future. But then you also have this family business and which is doing well and where you're being fit in. Like, did that cause any friction, or or was that like just the main focus at the time? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you when you go to engineering, you know, as as you know, especially mechanical engineering, our school is a really big feeder school for a lot of the defense industry, right? Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, um, Schlumberger, like 
I'm my my sites and all of my friends were doing this stuff, right? They were like, hey, let's let's gear up our four years so we can get a high paying salary at at you know a like a like a defense contractor or some sort of you know car firm GM Ford you know whatever that might be. Um, and so it was again this duality of like working you know weekends and and summers and kind of running this this store in Huntington Beach that's that's a pool store that was very different than what again everybody around me was doing of like, Hey, let's go get jobs at Northrop Lockheed and Um, So yeah, I mean, I, it, it, again, was a confusing time back to like high school, elementary school days of how come all my schools are, you know, all my friends are playing outside to the next phase of like, Hey, I'm supposed to go get a job at Lockheed Martin, but I'm running a pool store. Um, yeah. No, it's just so interesting. Right? Cause in Cephas have seen this, we've seen this ad nauseum. It's, it's, I'll play into your duality thought process. There's this paradigm, there's this juxtaposition of like, I'm not Lebanese enough to be in Lebanon, but I'm yeah. not American enough. So it's like, cool, I'm 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 Indian, we're here, but I'm not a Mekki at Boeing I'm running a pool store. And that and and stigma or not, like it's a really interesting paradigm where you're like, where do I fit? This sucks. Yeah. And then your mom's telling you to go, you know, <laughs> open the door for the plumber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we've seen it a lot. And I, I don't know if that's if that's great for founders. I just think like a lot of people who've been on here. Yeah, Seth, maybe maybe that's a great, you know, maybe that's an underlying thread of like, you kind of just got to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Interesting. That, that, uh, it, it definitely a is a, yeah, the uh, Ravi, the, the guests that we've interviewed so far, right? I think 95% of them have been kids of immigrants. So really? it, there, okay. there is definitely that pattern around like what they went through uh, upbringing, seeing uh, what they did, and then applying that to their to their future. And then, what did Ravi think too? Like, was Ravi like, "I'm an American Indian," or I'm, a, I'm a, you know, or am I, I'm an Indian American? You know, like, how yeah, did you yeah. even self assimilate? Oh my gosh! So actually, we'll probably get to this later, but um, later on. In oh, my well, then no, no, no I, spoiler alert! No spoiler. Okay. All right. I'll 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 actually keep this. I'll, I'll bookmark this point and actually bring it up when we start talking about that. Okay, Sweet. so just to wrap up like the, the hunting store, because you said you were there from, let's say, or, uh, senior year of high school through graduation. Like, talk us through, like, did you guys sell the store or what happened? Yeah, so uh, actually later on, um, after I started to go into the engineering world, right, um, my, my father actually then just started taking over more management and they started doing things in like e-commerce and, you know, it became a a typical kind of roll up of like a retail turn business that started off in the eighties and, you know, moved itself into the e-commerce world. Um, so at some point in time, you know, I just started to diverge from the business too, because I was just, you know, finding my own path. I was trying to figure out if I wanted to be in engineering. Um, and my dad was like, Hey, look, this, I just need to figure out how to manage this thing. And so, um, it just very much started becoming its own, its own monster at some point in time. Okay. And at what point did you leave the store or what, what caused that? It's it's funny because I don't think I ever left the store even today, right? I think like, it, and we'll get to this later too. But Sutro, my company now is a is initially is in the pool market, right? So I still like to this day live and breathe the pool industry. Um, so yeah, I think the answer to that question is like I don't I don't think I've ever left the pool industry or left the pool store. Well, I guess a different way of of when did you branch off from the family business on your own? Yeah, that that probably was after college. So like after I graduated, um, you know, senior year of, of of engineering, I then I then split away entirely. Like a hundred percent of my time was focused on other stuff and not you know working on the actual pool store. And and can you walk us through like what those other interests and aspirations were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you know, as I was in college, um, I I very much like had this yearning to travel, right? And like part of you know growing up as as an immigrant is you always go back to india uh for 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 your summer trips and so you know i think like when you go with your parents it's very different but then i started to travel alone and in in college i was kind of like look this like raytheon you know lockheed martin stuff is cool but uh how do i take engineering and and make it you know build it for good and so while i was in college we ended up uh, forming this organization called isagi which was international service and global impact um, and we would we would pair with the people that were doing study abroad 
and pair them up with basically nonprofits to do um, projects, right? So you're a kid, you're studying out in Brazil, you're studying in Peru for you know six months, study abroad. Why don't you spend a handful of weekends working with a local nonprofit that, that we found um, to kind of get credits? And so we did two projects, one in Brazil, one in Peru. Um, in Peru, we ended up building out a computer center uh, for, for people in the city so they could better communicate with people in the villages. And then in Brazil, we made basically a mobile medical clinic for orphanages. Um, so we worked with like the Red Cross to figure out how to basically distribute, you know, medicines to people in um, in the in these orphanages. Um, what year was this run? This was in 2007, 2008. Okay. In that time that's, frame. And that's wild because Canada, you know, those nonprofits, they, they can't afford top talent. Like that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that that was actually the vision, right? Of like, hey, look, these these very talented kids are sitting out yep. in these in these countries. Um, even if you gave like 5%, 7% of your time on a handful of weekends, um, you might be able to make a little bit more of a difference for these nonprofits. It's so interesting. I'm, I mean, it sure has scale. I'm wondering, is that still around at all? No, the we, after we left, it, it didn't kind of end up taking on. It ended up, I think it ended up getting merged into the study abroad program. And then I think the the woman who was leading it ended up leaving. So it just kind of a... Uh, Kind of fell down a little bit after that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so you've you've gone from kind of the um, you know family business side on towards the social nonprofit or or doing good side. Mm -hmm. We go from here. Okay. Well, uh, again, I want to I want our uh, viewer to understand not only the thought process but then also where you're being put right in different directions and what you wanted to to accomplish for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went after that and I told my dad, you know, the, the the big question or the big the big statement every Indian dad likes to hear of um I want to join the Peace Corps. And he's like, like, fuck no, you don't, right? <laughs> like you're not, you're not gonna my kid's not gonna go into the Peace Corps. Like what? We're gonna send you off for two and a half years and <laughs> you're gonna go live in, you know, like a like a village in Zimbabwe or something. Like, no, we're not, we're not gonna do that. Um, and so I, I, the collective, we like, no, we oh, are not doing yeah, yeah. that. We, 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 as all of your ancestors in the Indian population are not going to let you do this. <laughs> um, that's not going to happen. And so I kind of, you know, went back and re rejiggered my kind of need to want to travel and to do this Peace Corps, you know, this Peace Corps and quote stuff. And I found a, I found a graduate program in, um, Monterey, California, which is actually a school out of, um, it's 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 Middlebury's graduate school, which is in which is in Vermont. Vermont. Um, yeah. And uh I went back with, you know, a refined statement. And I, you know, my dad's like, hey, look, we collectively don't want you to go to the Peace Corps, but you have to go get a master's degree if you, you know, if you really feel like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna pay for your master's degree, but that's gonna be about that's gonna be your next step if you if you want to. Um, if not, go get a job, go work at late, you know, Raytheon Lockheed. And so I found this program in Monterey that did um, an MBA and also had the Peace Corps as a, they call it the PCMI, the Peace Corps Master's International Program, where you do a year of an MBA, two years of Peace Corps, and then you come back to finish off your last year. Fuck um, you, dad. And so, yeah, I was able to, I was able to like stitch the narrative. I'm like, hey, the Peace Corps comes in the middle and I get to still get my master's. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I ended up uh, applying to that program and, uh, and, and I got in. Um, in, in between there, I actually did do a really, really small stint at, um, at, at NASA jet propulsion laboratories. Um, and at JPL, I like got a, you know, internship, it was supposed to be an internship turned contract slash job to like work on, work on jet engines. And, uh, I, I published a paper. We got like a really cool, we got some pretty positive, um, research done on how to make jet engines more efficient. And like, I think if you Google it, Robbie Carney, NASA, the paper's probably on page number three of Google. But uh, yeah, that was that was like a stint that I did right in between mechanical engineering and and going to this uh, Peace Corps master's program. So can I ask like, what's the difference between like a, a regular master's and PCMI program? There, 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 there really is none. You still get your, you still get your MBA as you would if you were to just go to an MBA program for two years. It just so happens to be broken up with the Peace Corps program in between your two years. And, yeah. and I'm assuming the Peace Corps would then buy you outside of the U.S. to uh, different places and and be volunteer there. Exactly. Yeah, you you would separately apply to the Peace Corps program, and you would also get placed and you know do the stuff that Peace Corps would generally have you do. Um, and then and then you'd finish off the master's program at Middlebury Monterey. 
but with like a completely arbitrary stamp in between, or is like, hey, listen, there's an applicability of the first year of, of MBA, and then you're going to use it in your Peace Corps thought process, you know, or is it like, no, nah, MBA, fuck you, Zimbabwe? Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the Peace Corps program does have some sort of a mapping process, but it is a little bit disconnected from the actual master's program. Um, so the Peace Corps has a has a portfolio of projects, right? Yeah. They're like, yeah. we need to do five things in Zimbabwe, and these are the five things. Um, you get to pick number one, right, or number three, and so they'll still place you at that project. Most, you know, eighty percent of it probably has some relevance to your MBA, but it's not yeah. necessarily like I get to build my own project in the Peace Corps. Cool. You probably learned a lot more of being on the ground itself, working with different people than you did in the class. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, so uh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, uh, uh, just a quick question. Like, was the program that you did in, um, uh, sorry, you said it was in, um, uh, Monterey, the middle Monterey, yeah. yeah. Okay, sweet. And, and, uh, so that brought you closer towards or, or in Northern California, uh, you're still kind of going back and forth or was the idea to keep coming further North towards the tech side? You know, I, I I didn't honestly know what what the tech side really was. Like at that point in time, I'm like my my one goal was one, right? I'm like, hey, I got a master's program in the Peace Corps, kind of all arranged in one one little bucket, and so I'm like off to Monterey, right? I didn't I didn't really know what the next step was. Um, all I knew is that I you know I was going to go to the Peace Corps and do this do this master's program. Um, for when things actually took another turn when I went to Monterey. Um, I got to the program and a bunch of, it's a big Peace Corps school, right? Because of this PCMI program. And a lot of the Peace Corps students coming back were like, like, dude, you, you have an engineering degree and you're getting a mass, like, like an MBA. Um, you could do much, much, much better work in this new thing called impact investing, right? Where you're like working at the, at the intersection of profit and, and philanthropy um, to actually drive returns, right? Versus Peace Corps just being fully philanthropic. Um, and so Weirdly enough, just that year, the dean of the school um, was working with a a large funder in Florida um, that had built a small twenty million dollar fund in India to do it to to do exactly this right. And this was the beginning of impact investing. This was the beginning of ESG. Like people were doing sustainable stuff, but nobody really knew of this world of impact investing. And he's like, "Look, we'll we'll sub out your Peace Corps thing if you go and you help, like basically be an associate at this fund." Um, and figure out how to deal source and, you know, we'll let you finish up your master's program because it was a requirement to go to, you know, to actually go to the Peace Corps now. Um, and so they kind of moved that across and I, I got shipped to India actually for for a year um, working with First Light Ventures, um, which is now Village Capital. So Village Capital is actually a pretty big um, impact investing fund now. But uh, I kind of got to see the beginnings of that with um, Ross Baird, who is the founder of, of Village Capital, um, very, very early on in like 2020. 2012 or 2013, whenever that was. No, so so would you mind going a little, um, or or I'd love to hear the story in terms of how did they convince you to join, right? Like because again, it's it's a brand new kind of industry, so to speak. There's not much uh, conversation about it. As somebody who's already demonstrated uh, this this need to do good, what made you want to work with them? Yeah, I think this this kind of goes back to your question of getting pulled up to the valley a little bit, right? While being in Monterey, um, the drive's only two hours, right? And so many times they'll take MBA students and truck them up to San Francisco. And this is, you know, in the beginning year of my of of my master's program, I really started to get just shown, right? I wouldn't say necessarily interested or involved, just shown to the world of San Francisco venture capital investing, like. What does it mean to have even have a startup, right? I mean, I, I come from a pool store, so I don't, and I had engineering. I don't really know like how Kleiner Perkins works or like, how do you do a pitch deck? And I, I don't know, right? And so seeing a lot of that world, I there was kind of these like multiple vectors that started to hit me, right? It was these Peace Corps kids coming back being like, hey, you could do much better if you did um, finance, business and engineering somewhere else, right? Um, it's like the travel that still was sitting at the top of my head of like, how do you, Re, you know, reconcile this Peace Corps assignment with something that could be actually useful where I do travel. Um, and then at the same right, just like taking all that feedback with this opportunity that now kind of showed up from the Dean and being like, hey, maybe they're like, maybe this thing fell in my lap for a reason, right? Maybe there's like something here that, that I'm supposed to learn. Um, and so it was like a series of these vectors that were kind of coming from multiple directions that 
were, were like driving me towards this uh, towards this assignment. And any guilt in that decision? Um, no, actually, not not at all. Because I think I like checked off the boxes of like wanting to wanting to do good with this piece. Like the Peace Corps, in quotes, ended up becoming this India assignment, running an impact investing fund, right, or being an yeah. associate in an impact investing fund. So like I cool. got those two to kind of you know hold true. I didn't not finish up my master's, right? I still got the MBA. So, you know, family, dad, the entire Indian diaspora of my ancestors were yeah. happy. Um, and then the, the cool thing is that I like obviously was getting shown this, this Silicon Valley flavor and VC investment angel fund, yeah. like were all these big headlines of like, oh, that's cool. Like, let's go ahead and do this in India and see what that means. And what did that, what did I look like? So you joined firm, um, and now you're, you're going to India. What was the, the kind of mandate from the firm? And then what was the long-term positioning for the fund itself? Yeah, so the, the long-term positioning of the fund was to find alpha returns in impact investments, right? So like we want to stray away from this pure Silicon Valley, pure investment, pure Wall, pure Wall Street focus that doesn't take into consideration externalities, right? Um, and let's go ahead and build this fund in India um, with the main premise in finding alpha returns in impact investments and secondarily in funding companies that built products for people who earned less than $2 a day, right? People under basically the poverty line. Um, and so when you get into that market, right, of people that earn less than $2 a day, all of your, your regular US economic thought goes down the drain, right? There is when you have two dollars a day to spend, you're not you're not spending the way we are, right? You don't think about things the same way. Your your problem set's very different, um, and so it was it was very interesting and kind of when I was in India, right? We we did a lot of market research. To we traveled through the villages. We like saw a whole bunch of different business models. Um, that was like really really interesting because everything I learned in MBA was typical U.S. based Western finance, and then you step into this territory and you're like, whoa! Everything I just learned actually is through the door. Um, my investment thesis is like US minded again, back to duality, but my entire job and the companies that I fund live in a world that, you know, I'm very unfamiliar with. Um, and so, yeah. So how, how long did you spend, uh, in India for the fund? Uh, I spent about a year, I think it was like 11 months total that I was in, that I was in Bombay. And can you give us a sense of what, like, uh, any, any cool companies or any cool projects that you guys funded at that time? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, some really cool projects. So I was kind of step in COO for, for this company called Under the Mango Tree, um, which was a hybrid business model. They had a nonprofit side that gave bee boxes to people in, in like villages, right? Um, bees in general will pollinate crops, which actually increase yields. And then secondarily, they also make honey. Um, the honey was then procured by the for-profit side to sell in the Oberoi Hotel, the Taj Hotel, um, you know, all the big hotels in 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 India, um, under you know under a kind of locally sourced sustainable label, right? Like, hey, this thing's like literally coming from a village that you guys are help funding. Um, that was one of them. The other one was a company actually out of Stanford called Delight Design. Um, they basically were um, village electrification. Right, so a, a big problem that that villages have, and especially in India, um, ones that are non-electrified, um, most importantly, women, women and children don't have time later in the evenings to study or do work. Right, you can actually extend the amount of time that you have once the sun sets if you can get a little bit more lit hours um, in the in the end of the night. Um, and so these guys basically made solar lanterns, right, that would charge throughout the day with a little battery. You could hang it up inside your home, um, extremely cheap. And so um, that's one that we funded. And then a third one that was really cool, I totally forget the name of the company, but it was helping local um, small batch Indian farmers. And so if you guys are familiar with the with the Indian agricultural world, um, they don't have big farming like, like we do here in the US, right? There's a lot of super amount of really, really large base of small farmers that all trickle up. Um, they're like Amul Milk Story is like a super, super, super cool case study. Um, the company that we funded was giving out like really, really cheap flip phones to, um, Indian villagers. And they basically made a text-based system that would give them weather updates, right? So having information on the weekly weather, like when it's going to rain, you know, if you should till your soil, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, was really interesting and important to to farmers, right? And so that's that's like another um, startup that we funded. But uh, those are three that yeah come to mind. And Seth, I don't. Have you met Chris over the Zoom? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what Harvest does. So I think it's really interesting that you're talking about it, uh, Robbie, because you're talking, you're speaking to these exigent circumstances that might not play in the U.S. You're talking about food scarcity. You're talking about, you know, so I, I think that's really, that's really bespoke to what you did. And it's such an interesting paradigm to then come here and be like, hmm, how can I apply my thought process here to these? Because most of the time, like, okay, that TAM not 91 billion is a bazillion. You're like, no, it's not, motherfucker, but it's going to work. Look past this, you douche. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's also interesting to see like how, you know, um, so when I went to Pakistan, ESG was a huge part of it. Like how to, how to, you know, there's, there's a percent of population, which is over the poverty line, but there's a huge mass, like majority, which is under, so how do you serve them? And it's interesting. Some of these projects that you're talking about, there's, I feel there are variations that are still being iterated on to this day. Um, and I'd love to get to your thoughts on like, as somebody who was working on the ground uh, in this phase, like for so long, before everybody, before it became cool, do you feel like the industry is getting better and better? Or is it like, is the impact about the same regardless? Yeah, I think it's the, it's like the first mover problem, right? Um, were we doing probably more impactful and cool work back then? Like, I think so, because we were, we were like at the, the forefront of it, right? Fast forward 10, 15 years, um, seeing more people in the space, is that better? Yeah, I mean, of course, right? Because you're getting more money in the space. I mean, we had, we had like this dinky $20 million fund and we were trying to like change the world by, with, with that, right? It's like, look, you need billions, if not trillions of dollars to really make uh, phase change shifts in, in, in these markets with these products. Um, is there a lot of greenwashing? Yeah. Like, is there stuff that's just being said for the sake of saying it without really doing any sort of studies behind it? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think there is kind of this double-edged sword of like, it is good and it's also bad at the same time. So you spent this year in India coming back. Are you, you're still with Village Capital at this point or... Um, yeah, actually, I, I do want to come back to um, Raj's point really quick um, of this duality um, that we were talking about earlier, right? Of like living as an Indian in America. The, the craziest thing was when I went back to India and actually worked there, right? Like I was in, I was the step in COO at an, at an Indian company with, with obviously employed Indians. Um, and man, feeling the duality there is like, you then really know that you don't, you, that you're just floating in this gray area, right? Like in, you're in the US, white guy. Exactly. You're, well, you're not, you're also not the, you're not the white dude from the U S you're like, the, you're the coconut from the U.S., right? You're like brown on the outside, white on the inside. Um, your your Indian accent sucks, right? You like you obviously speak and understand the language, but you sound like a tool. Um, like, and then you don't want to say, then you don't wanna, then you want to speak it exactly. So then you go to this kind of like American mentality. You're like, fine, I'll just be the American bro in the room, and then you become super aggressive, right? Yeah. So people are just like, man, you you like don't fit. Like you're like our long lost cousin from the U.S. now. And then you go back to the U.S. and you're also a coconut, right? You're like brown on the outside and white on the inside. So like all your white friends are just like, like, hey, dude, that works at the pool store because your parents make you to get all, you know, straight A's like dweeb, right? It's just like, and then at the same time, oh, you can't have a girlfriend. Like you can't, you can't do these things. What like, what kind of a weirdo are you? Um, and so you, you're right. You don't fit in as being an Indian in like the American world or being an American in the Indian world or vice versa in both spots, right? And so like, um, that's kind of where it really hit me of after going back to India and living there, I always thought I was Indian in the US. I'm like, well, maybe I'm just Indian. And then you go to India and you're like, no, I'm not Indian either. Um, and so, yeah. I got to ask, where was the affinity, you know, or a lack thereof worse? In um, India, did you feel even more like judged? Yes, I, I think in both areas, but at some point in time, I think I just took that same uncomfortable American tact that I had growing up here. And I was like, let's just flip the poles around. Right. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm living the same life on the other side. And so yep. let's just figure out how to, how to kind of live and work with it. Interesting. No, that's a, that's a fantastic point. Cause like for, for people who, you know, again, growing up as kids, immigrants over here, and then usually when you go back and forth, right, you meet fam, you're, you're that, that cousin from the U S who just visiting. 
But then when you actually move, it's it's a complete different environment where even your family at times, right? They're, they're trying to include you. They're trying to treat you one and the same. But there were so many times for myself as well, where I'm sitting, I'm talking to them and like my aunt will go, wait, you said the weird word. What does that mean? Yeah. Like, I always thought that was like a regular thing to say, <laughs> right? And, but, and then you, you kind of get, uh, especially at, uh, at whatever age you are, you can get a little subconscious as well in terms of like, okay, maybe I should shut up. Maybe in a professional environment, I should act like this because it, it kind of turns into this need, uh, not just for validation, but then also to get the work that you need done that, okay, if, if by me acting this way, this is going to accomplish this task, then you kind of just go, go stick to it. Yeah, 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 entirely. That's awesome. So, um, well, go. Uh, you're back from from India now. You're still at Village Capital. Um, are you still like uh, one of your mandates is to invest in India, or, or were you only focus? Was the fund focused on India at the time? The the fund was only focused on India. Um, I think they maybe had like an Africa contingent, but I I forget. Um, once I finished that up that, that stint, I came back to um to Monterey for one more semester for so for six months. And then I finished up my coursework. Um, weirdly ended up writing, well, part of the Peace Corps assignments actually to like learn a language. And so I ended up writing my thesis in Gujarati. Like I, I just had to do that. And so, yeah, I did it. That was, that was a little crazy too. Um, but yeah, came back to Monterey, ended up finishing up my, my master's and then um, worked actually for, Shrina might talk about this. I worked for the predecessor of the fund that she used to work for, which was Better Ventures. Um, it was actually called Hub Ventures at that time. And I worked with uh, Rick and Wes when I came back to San Francisco, because that was kind of, you know, again, the the, the closest, um, you know, lily, lily pad on the pond that you could like jump onto next. And so uh, that was that was kind of where I went to in San Francisco. And was that a, a big difference? Because you've got one uh, social good focus fund was better ventures also in the same space. Or? They were also in the same space. So the hub was a, was a um, impact based like um, co-working space. And so uh, yeah, everybody in there was, was, was focusing on social sustainable um, ESG related things. And, and you were on the deployment side as well. Like, so you're in due, due diligence, you're meeting the founders, you're deciding whom to invest, and then you're managing the investments as well. Correct. The yeah. Higher thing. Yeah. And, and as a, a the, like for my own interest, as somebody who's, say, a young professional at a fund, right? And a fund is still cool, whether it's 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, like you're dealing with money that's not yours, but being mm -hmm. trusted to deploy it and do good, right? Like, what, what, when people ask me all the time, like, hey, when I, how do I get into VC? How do I do this? How do I do that? Like, did you ever face any of those kinds of situations where you're like, holy shit, I've giving all, I've been giving all this responsibility. I've been giving all this trust. Like, uh, did, did the imposter syndrome or anything kind of come to place at that point? Or were your, uh, your GPs just super focused and good about like empowering you? Oh, no, no, in, entirely. Like imposter syndrome was was 100% true there, right? I think alongside even just my assignment, right? Like the fact that I was there from the master's program, that I'd studied an MBA, I was working in this in this area that I, you know, never really dealt with and this kind of under the poverty line, sort of under $2 a day uh, markets with startups, right? I'd never run due diligence. We had like a due diligence checklist, but I mean, after you know your first 10, those are your first 10. Like you don't, you don't know what the heck you're supposed to ask them. You know what a founder is supposed to feel like. It's just, you kind of just, uh, you kind of just do it. And then I, I think, you know, part of that imposter syndrome, like was only exponentially compounded by being the American in India. Right. And then the Indian guy that's supposed to be Brown, that's living in like this whole thing was just stacks on stacks of, of imposter syndrome. And so, um, entirely man, 110%. And I, um, maybe we can uh, leave this for later on, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, not only on imposter syndrome, but then also kind of getting over it. Yeah, 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 definitely. Cool. So you're, you're at um, the hub now. And um, so we're at Village, uh, Village Capital for a couple of years. You're at the hub now doing similar kinds of work. How long were you at uh, working with the hub for? Um, so I worked at the hub for, man, I think it's only like six or eight months. Um, and then I, I very quickly went back into actually consulting. Um, well, not back into consulting. I went into consulting. 
um, I started working for a boutique um, building management fund. And so these guys were basically going into the built environment, right? The Empire State Building, the Transamerica Pyramid, large, large buildings. And we would basically run energy efficiency audits on them, right? If you've heard about the LEED, the LEED certification, um, I was basically doing LEED certifications for this consulting firm. And so, uh, yeah, very much went into like the other side of finance, but again, still sustainably minded, right? It's all around energy efficiency, like like the built environment, um, but more on the on the consulting and finance side. And and how was that switch for you? Like, was it was it an easy switch because it's it can be a different spectrum? Yeah, I mean, it it actually came way more naturally to me than you know working in India or working at a fund. Um, mostly because the the work was pretty cut and dry, right? Like once you once the sales process is done and they've got a client in, I mean, there's there's n number of possibilities and it becomes an engineering problem, right? You take a look at their HVAC, you make sure that they're you know just generally efficient in like the energy. You make sure that you look at the operations. You know, there's just like there's a bullet point checklist and the lead certification itself. You have to you know it's a test. Like if you hit an 80%, you're going to get a lead gold or a lead silver, whatever those uh, grades are. And so that's, it was overall much more of a comfortable environment coming out of the MBA, learning finance, and then the engineering background, it's, they were, they were all Excel spreadsheets, right? At that point in time. Yeah. And, and well, you're, you're doing consulting at this point, but like, I'm, I'm sure entrepreneurship is on your mind too, right? Because you, you've been on both sides of the table at this point as a young, uh, young professional, who's been involved with some really awesome teams, but then also has had success with his family's business on, on by his own merit. So from the, you, you said you were uh, with the consulting firm for a couple months or, or did that engagement last for a while? No, the consulting firm, I think I was there for like two or three years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, uh, it was a longer time. And, and was that like, was that more fun than the, some of the other experiences? Like, because it, it seems like you stuck around, with this the longest than any other engagement too. I, I mean, I think it was honestly paying the bills for San Francisco, right? It was my first job in the city outside of the fund. Um, and I wasn't like crashing on couches and stuff, right? I could like, I got a paycheck. It would hit every two weeks. Um, you know, I, I think now you probably cringe at the fact, but I like enjoyed wearing a tie and a suit and like walking downtown. Like it was just, it was cool to be in that environment for those years. Um, and then visiting some of the biggest buildings in, in, in the world, right? Like we did the Transamerica pyramid. I got to go to the roof. Like you got to see what the HVAC looks like. You got to meet the building owners. You just learned a lot about also like financing how building works, right? I learned a lot about REITs, the real estate investment trusts. Um, that's who we were pitching to because if you're about to buy, you know, if Bank of America from Aegon was about to buy the Transamerica pyramid and they have, you know, 100K in net operating costs per month and a lead certification drives that down to 60 well, now you have a better asset on your hand than you otherwise would, right? And so we would come in when a lot of times when these trades were about to happen to help basically make the financials look more healthier. Um, so it, it it was like very, very in the weeds and very, very interesting from like that standpoint. And and very niche. Like, I don't know if there are too many companies or REITs out there that, that work on it. Yeah, no, it's, it's extreme. There is a very small world of them. Yeah, and our founder knew, um, you know, a big portion of them. So that was like, that was also cool. And so you're, you're now at this stage where you've gone the entrepreneurship route, you've gone the fun route, you, you've, you've gone the, the, the hungry entrepreneur route, let's say, and you finally had some success in the corporate world. You're, you're stable, you're, you're, you know, building up your coffers. Now, like what, what was the thought process to figure out what was next? Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of funny because I, like living in San Francisco, you don't, you don't ever do one thing, right? I think like even, even being in my, in, in the house that I lived in, I don't know if you've met this dude, uh, Prashant at all. If you ever, when you slept on our couch with uh, Mahim. I may have like just randomly. Um, our, our house was like, you know, a, a startup house, like everybody, every night, you know, over, over beers and like dinners that we got, um, there would just always be some conversation, some idea, you know, some of them were always still at the, at the co-working space. Some of them had raised some money, some of them were, were failing, like, you know, everything was around all the time. And when you're just kind of, you know, like soaked in this environment and there's just always people passing by your radar, um, you're always just kind of coming up with, you know, nine dumb ideas and one, one eventually will kind of take off. Um, at that time, you know, interestingly enough, I kind of, because I was getting paid, I'm like, how do I make a little bit more money? Right. And so I went, and that's kind of where I started, um, 
chatting with my dad because he had brought his pool stores onto this e-commerce world, right? This was kind of the beginning of Amazon really coming above. It's like 2015, 2016, 2017, generally in that time frame. Um, a lot of e-commerce was blowing up. You know, Shopify had just gotten started like a few years before. And so I, you know, I was like, how do we take, well, how many SKUs are there? Like 3000 SKUs and put them all on Amazon. How do we take that and put that on Shopify? Um, Shopify was still doing CSVs, right? You'd put stuff into Excel sheets and drag and drop them up to the website. Um, and so we, we, st I helped them start running this e-commerce business. Um, that kind of, you know, combined with a project that I had an idea of when I was in India, when I was working at, um, at the, at the fund was around water sensing. So this is kind of where, where it all started to coalesce together. Um, a lot of the deal flow that we saw in India was around like water filtration, right? Everybody wanted to make like the jack of all trades of, Hey, we can fix drinking water because that's, that's a big problem in India. Um, but when I started looking into the water, into the water world, um, water requires a different output based off of the application that it's being used for, right? If you have, you don't, you want chlorinated water for your swimming pool because it kills bacteria, but you probably don't want to grow your plants with that. You don't want to drink that chlorinated water. You also don't want to drink, you know, highly fertilized water that you use for your plants. Um, and so I started looking in the water sensing market of like, if we know what's wrong with water, if we know what the water needs, we can then better filter it, fix it, put chemicals in it to basically get to right size the water for the application you're using for, um, you know, ended up tabling that project for, for, for a decent amount of time until running this e-commerce store. Right. And so I, at that point in time, I was at point of purchase with thousands of people that were buying our stuff. You know, I was kind of running customer support for the, for the Amazon store nights and nights and weekends again. Um, and I was like, holy shit, if pool stores are moving to the internet and this is when Tony Fidel had just made, you know, nest, um, a lot of these like smart things were starting to come around. The guy that had made the uh, doorbell product, which is now Ring, had pitched. I, I remember sitting across from at CES, like, or he was across the alley. Like all of this stuff was happening at this time. And I'm like, what if I just took everything my dad did in a pool store, this sensor concept, shove it in a robot and make an IoT product that basically does the same shit that I used to do for the last 20 years at the pool store, but does it digitally and virtually. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what gave the initial birth of, of the company that I run now, Sutro, which was the initial idea of this, of this robot. Um, again, starting with the long tail of how do we fix water, which is a really, really big issue around the world. Um, but obviously starting from the swimming pool industry, um, to kind of, you know, finance the model with wealthy pool owners and then, uh, use that capital to kind of build this, build this long tail. Oh, that's, that's fascinating because so. I, I've heard of the Sutro story a couple of times. I've fo been following you for a while. I never understood that the the, um, the 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 idea came about from actually trying to figure out like for drinking water and then reverse engineering. And that that kind of gives you the sense of the engineering mind too, right? Breaking down the problem into small parts. But then I think it's also very important for our entrepreneur viewers to understand that you can have an end goal in mind, but it's okay to you know wiggle around here and there to be, or get done what you need to in order to achieve that long term. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, if, if we like do this podcast and rewind and you, and you hit the end goal of where I'm at now, I mean, there's nothing but wiggling for, for since the beginning, right? I, I don't think any of it's actually a straight line. Um, and, and more importantly, they're just, they're kind of these, these layers that you learn early, early on in life that just slowly start to come back as you start unraveling these threads. Right. And like, eventually you come to like something that you're going to be passionate about that you're happy about, but like sometimes being overly stubborn, you know, also puts you in a ditch as well, because like, you know, you can't, you can't just drive straight because there's a barrier there. That's amazing. So, so you start Sutro and, and what year was, was this? Man, I think that was like 2015, if I'm not mistaken. I think I remember seeing a tech crunch video that we did in 2015. Yeah, and kind of walk me. So, um, how did you find your co-founder, or how did you find the uh, initial people to work with, uh, initial fundraising? Yeah, it's it's interesting, man. Sutro has gone through so many revisions. Um, so, when I actually I didn't mention this when I came back from India, um, a big problem with with impact investing is was was there was no Crunchbase right back in the time. Crunchbase was the only database that you would find where you could invest in startups. 
And so we basically had a, a really long list of companies that we'd find found in India and found in you know Africa and whatnot. Um, and we basically built built the crunch base for impact investing called uh, Impact Space. Um, that was actually merged with the with the tech crunch, right? Which with the with the media arm of impact investing called Impact Alpha, um, which is actually still around now. David Bank has like grown this thing to to an amazing um, company, and Impact Space is still nested within this um, this media arm. Um, Outside of that, kind of, you know, what what ended up happening and how kind of I found my co-founder was um, there was a there was a woman that I worked with um, at Impact Space Impact Alpha, um, and I was like, hey, I'm doing this Amazon thing, and she was helping me out with that, and I'm like, hey, we should totally build the Sutro thing, right? Like, I think we can have an IoT product, and she's like, that sounds cool. So, you know, a founder from another spot, we kind of both merged together, and we and we built the company from there. Um, Ended up, you know, doing the usual thing startups do: apply for accelerators, you know, raise your first few dollars. Um, we ended up bringing on a CTO um, as well that actually was um, part of the friend group that I had. Right, so back to kind of where do you find your co-founders? Came within my network. Um, a guy had just sold his previous company, and he was kind of like, "Hey, I'm free to 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 work on IoT." Um, was an electrical engineer, and we kind of brought him on board. And then we, you know, obviously started hiring people and bring building the team from the kind of bottom up. But uh, that was like the initial initial story of how we founded it. And where at what point, like in Sutro's journey, did you feel because you you mentioned you were wiggling around and trying to figure things out? At what point did you guys like hone in on? Okay, this is what we're focusing on, and this is what's working. Yeah, twenty. I think twenty fifteen was like when we incorporated the company and took our first, you know, like fifty thousand dollar check. Was when we were just like, oh, we're doing this full full time. There is, you know, there's no more side jobs. There's none of this stuff. We're gonna like, we need to focus on this on a, on one hundred and ten percent of our time. Awesome. And uh, the initial team was just the two of you, or did you have some other believers? It was just the two of us um, initially, and then our first fifty k check we got from a. <laughs> hardware accelerator in Boston uh, called the called the Bolt Fund. Um, and they didn't have a, a San Francisco office. So I actually moved out there for, I don't know, six months or eight months, something like that. Um, slept on my buddy's couch in Cambridge, took the red line into Chinatown every single day and basically started building it from, from there. Um, Bolt had a, a handful of, of like shared fractional advisors that would help you with electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, right? So like we could start building the product with this with this assistantship, but uh, we didn't necessarily have um, employees on staff. Yeah, it seems seems pretty similar to what the tech shop used to do um, in, yeah. uh, in San Jose back in the day. Exactly, um, which, exactly. And, and we'll, we'll get to this as well, but hardware. So in Pakistan, I was fortunate to invest in three different hardware companies, like IoT companies world of a difference between you know regular software because we're, you're dealing with the manufacturing side you're dealing with the distribution side any you know qa etc like for a team of two people obviously uh you're engineers and you're you're building the, or designing this thing like what were some of the other challenges which maybe you hadn't really predicted based on all this previous experience working with the team yeah i mean i think we the, the first thing that kind of hit us was we didn't think about how complicated the hardware would be. Um, so we initially wanted to take something off the shelf, right? Which is kind of what everybody always tells you, which is true. It's the path of least resistance. Um, don't make your life more complicated than it is because you're already running a startup to begin with. And so um, when we took this off the shelf product, off the shelf sensor, we very quickly realized that the sensor over time uh, began to drift. Right. So in the way that I like to explain it is it's like a it's like a speedometer that reads the wrong speed when you're traveling on the road. And so if you're expecting to go 60 miles an hour and the speed limits, you know, 60, but your speedometer is reading 90 and you're actually going 60, you're going to slow down. Right. And so that's garbage in, garbage out. Like if you don't have a speedometer that reads correctly, you can't properly fluctuate your speed based off of the speed limit. Um and that's even worse with water chemistry, right? If you're like trying to figure out if you need to put chlorine or pH or acid, especially with acid and base, if you're on the wrong side of that pH scale, you're putting in the opposite chemical in. Um, and so we ended up kind of trashing that sensor after we deployed about a hundred prototypes and uh, basically had to rebuild an entire sensor cluster from scratch. 
um, which took a good part of like four to four and a half years. Um, we actually have patents and stuff, but you know, it wasn't the easy, like, hey, slap a Wi-Fi chip on top of a, you know, on top of a sensor and then throw it out in the market and build an app around it. Um, I wish I could have been, you know, the hardware is the Trojan horse to the software. That would have been like, that's still our idea, but we had to actually design the software or sorry, design the hardware. And what was that experience like? Because I, there are very few entrepreneurs who I've met who have designed a piece of hardware from scratch and especially at the scale that Sutra is doing. Oh my gosh, it, it, it hurts. Like I, I think back to the, to the pain of, you know, like legitimately designing a sensor. So what, so the way that our sensor works, um, you ever been like, a, you know, taking a test strip or a test kit at a pool where you take the sample of water and you put little drops inside there, the water changes color. Um, we took from the medical industry, um, funnily enough, actually Theranos was getting started at this time too. And so the, so the word microfluidic was in, was in, you know, high regard. Um, and so she was doing microfluidics for medical. We were doing microfluidics for water. Um, our stuff works and it still works. Right. So, um, very different story, but, um, we were shrinking down the size of a test kit by one fiftieth of its size. Um, and so that's basically what we have inside the Sutro. It's, it's legitimately a floating laboratory that, uh, instead of putting in five drops, we put in one fiftieth of a drop of reactant or the assay inside of the, inside of the sample. And then we use computer vision to basically look at the color the same way that a human that you would, when you use a test kit. Um, that all gets you know sent to the cloud, it gets computed, and then it gets given to the user in a very simple, understandable thumbs up, thumbs down, put in chemicals or don't. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, that's what we built. <laughs> and like you said, it took you guys four and a half years to get the your own sensors right. Yeah, correct. We we started off with something that was about the size of a desk, <laughs> and now we oh, I actually have one here. Um, Shrunk it to the size of my the size of my forearm. This is the sutra right here. But yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And I think what's wild is I, I don't think founders and, and please speak to Ravi, like hardware's different. Hardware's different. That's patient capital. That's a lot of capital. That's I mean, I can't even imagine you said four years. I like, got four weeks investors like, all right, where's your MRR? <laughs> Motherfucker. Like, chill, Karen. But like yeah. I don't think people understand hardware is a beast. It is patient capital. It's a lot of it. Like, you know, that's an uphill battle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, entirely. And, you know, even, even fundraising is, is an uphill battle, right? You, you, you have this hardware concept and you get the same problem from investors. They're like, yep. we, don't, we don't invest in any hardware. It's like, well, we, we got to make a product. Like, there's no way to measure water. You can't just look at it and, you know, have it yeah. tell you what's going on. So it is, yeah. It's it's funny because um so Raj runs a a double sided marketplace connecting health and wellness providers with people who need them right, and uh, when when he was ra uh, raising money, there's obviously the question around like hey you need people on both sides of the marketplace, but then you have the software component on the hardware side, which you're pretty much run your own marketplace of products or pool products with your own hardware, your own software, and your own customers, like. Those are three to four different kinds of segments that you have to build the business around. Entirely. Compared to, you know, a software company that's just focusing on one. Exactly. So, yeah. Talk to us a little about that patient capital. Like, um, because if if you're raising enough money to sustain your prototype into a, a scalable, you know, um, mass-produced product, like what kind of investors did you guys focus on? And then what was what was it like communicate with the investors? communicating through all the challenges and all the, let's say, delays or whatever until you got it right? Yeah, I mean, so we, initially we had pitched the vision of taking this off the shelf sensor, right? So like, which which very quickly we had to kind of turn around because the, the data came back for it to not be, just wasn't successful uh, because of this drift issue. Um, when we started setting out to build our own sensor, you know, I think we like drastically misdefined when we'd be able to launch um, just because like it's it's tough right like we didn't know the complexity of making a mold of making a tool I mean there's these massive machines that have you know negatives and positives and they shoot plastic inside there and they pump out plastic that process to make that tool in itself takes nine months like like any Chinese manufacturer will take about nine six to nine months to make you a tool um, 
And so, you know, we just, we were like, oh yeah, this next year we're going to be able to launch. And so, you know, being, being novices and not being, you know, knowing how to scalably make hardware, um, there was, there was like left and right turns all the time. And I think it was painful sending an update to investors, you know, continuously of like, Hey, we we're off again, we're off again. Like we just need to go back and redo this thing because we're trying to custom build the sensor. Um, and we'd always get back, like, are you sure there's nothing on the market? Are you sure you just can't take anything off the shelf? It's like, we've searched far and wide. I mean, we've, we've, you know, we've brought in PhDs from the water monitoring industry. Like this stuff doesn't like exist. And we are really building something from scratch. Um, on top of that, being a first time founder, right? Like all these checks are against you. And so you might go into a venture capitalist that wants to fund hardware, but they're like, well, we don't even know if you're going to be the guy to do it because you may not know how to do it. And, and I don't truthfully, um, if I go in now, I can be like, I'm sure as hell know what the heck I'm doing, but like I didn't back then. Um, and so, yeah, um, we found funding from, um, strategics. I think strategics are really, really great for hardware companies because VCs, you know, like you said, Raj, are, are looking for the four-week turnaround, the two-week turnaround, if you're lucky. Um, strategics are core to your market, right? You're kind, of a, you're kind of a mosquito or a fly to them. And so they feel much better because they have a really large engineering budget and they can piece off a part of that and give you something because you're, you're, their, you're their moonshot, right? You might, you might do something good in the, in the kind of long term. Um, we raised money from a lot of angels, right? A lot of people that had been in hardware that had had like exits. Um, there was a few hardware funds that were around at that time, but every single hardware company was pitching to them. And so the, you know, you have a, you have a lot of guys trying to date you. And so it was a, it was a, that was a problem. The attrition um, problem. At least. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but that's kind of who we, who we ended up raising from. Can you give us an example of one of the strategics? Cause it's such uh, a ubiquitous kind of universal generic term. It's like, on the hardware side, in the pool industry specifically, who was a strategic in your mind? Yeah, so they were um, the equipment companies, right? So uh, one of them actually invested in us. They're the, in a pool, you have your pump, your filter, and your heater, right? The actual equipment that runs the water circulation. Mm -hmm. um, there's like four big brands that that sell those, and so we basically fundraise from one of them. Awesome. And was was there any overlap or because one, one other um, situation that I've seen with especially when you're looking for that strategic partner or investor, right? There's this this kind of feeling as a as an entrepreneur where you're like, I don't want to give him too much because it's for a behemoth that has all this money and talent and this this knowledge. Guess what? They can just steal my idea and pull it out. That was that ever a um, problem? It it was. Um... It's always a thought in the back of your head, but at some point in time, you need to like, you need to move, right? I mean, I I remember actually back when I was in India and and any company that would make me sign an NDA, I'm just like, man, I don't have the bandwidth or the time to steal your idea. Like different for a strategic, I get it, right? As a VC, I was in a very different spot than like somebody that's a direct competitor or could be from this uh, strategic standpoint. But um, they're also busy, right? They don't like some, like one engineer that hears this microfluidic chip for Sutro and water monitor, like monitoring. If it's really that easy, it, it wouldn't have taken, you know, 10 guys working 150% of their time, four years to make it. Like yeah. no corporation has that sort of mind power, which is why startups are just so nimble and agile in the, in, in the beginning years. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you're the initial accelerator program. Like, so both that you were with, at the beginning, did they provide or were they able to continuously provide value or were they just, you know, first, let's say it's eight, nine months or a year. And then it's like, okay, you guys, here's our list of people and resources. You guys can deal with them yourself. Yeah. The, 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 the system was kind of built more in, in the ladder, right? So they did have like a fixed time that they would help us um, in a little bit more dedicated format. And then once we got certain milestones done, then they kind of took us off where we could pay for resources. Um, yeah, I mean they, you know, you have to think about their business model. They also bring in companies that are coming in from the from the top of funnel. And um as a as an existing portfolio company, you can't take up too much of their time, right? So at some point in time, you need to go and fundraise and also pay for your own resources. Good. That's a great point. Um so you you've you're, you're, I think we're at about like four or four and a half years uh into the Sutra story where you guys have found let's call it product market fit. What 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 go what happens next? 
so that's that's actually interesting. We spent about four years developing the prototype, and then we got picked up by an acquisition. So we actually in in my my startup years, I never really got the ability to actually fully manufacture the product with you know investor dollars. Basically, um, we have now because the our, our acquirer who has been absolutely amazing. Um, you know, funded the entire operation for the last, I think it's been a good three or four years now. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we, we have been on the market as of the last three years, but when I sold the company, um, we weren't even on the market yet. We, we had a proof of concept or prototype that worked, um, and like, we're about to go into manufacturing. And, and this, um, your, uh, your acquirer, did they like just find you from the noise that you guys were making in the market or? Was this through a pitch that you guys had done? A, a little bit of both, right? So we were making noise in the market, but then secondarily, I was also pitching to the strategics, right? And so part of the pitch process was like, hey, we could just like buy you guys because we see, you know, clear value here of the thing you guys are building. Um, you know, a little bit of back and forth, tug of war, and we we ended up signing the papers. And um, so what's the difference been like? As, so you're still the founder, you're still the CEO of the company, but now you have adults, let's say, who are kind of leading you in certain directions. Has that and, been and a challenge? Before we get or? there, Robbie, before we get there, because I think this is an interesting spot for a lot of founders. A lot of founders are like, hmm, and maybe not four years in, maybe they find some traction. So for example, strategics on my side are the same way. So digital health and wellness, but for me, I'm a strategic partner slut because that's a great go-to-market. That's a great part of market fit. It's a great distro channel. Yeah. So it's not by sheer happenstance that when I was going direct consumer with apartment complexes, REITs were a lot of my strategic. So I knew in the end, a $40 billion REIT for an exit strategy, like, oh, it's there's a method to the madness. But I know for me, I won't project. It's like, okay, we're kicking off this. You're sniffing me. Okay, let's 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 give it a run on a Forex. I, I mean, can you, what's your thought process? You're like, you know what, dude, it's four years of dealing with investors. I want out because candidly that cathartic experience hit me not too long ago. I'm like lifestyle play. I'm in. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a little bit of a little bit of everything, right? I think the the part that kind of started to creep into my mind at, at that stage, um, the catharsis wasn't necessarily the lifestyle, which, which obviously was nice, but it was more about kind of getting back to the roots, right? I had started it, this, the Sutra product with this idea from India, getting back, to the Peace Corps stuff, getting back to doing water for agriculture, water for drinking water. Um, and the the acquirer is in all of these markets, right? They're not just a pool company. Um, and so they sell sanitation and, and chemicals into drinking water, into agriculture, into food and bev. And their their model, their, their, their pitch to me also was like, hey, if you get this right in pool and spa, because they also have a pool and spa arm, we could we could bubble this thing back up and horizontally move across our all of our verticals and maybe even more um, that are outside of our company. Um, are you interested in taking this thing? And I'm like, heck, like heck yeah! I would never. For me to see that sort of a reality, I mean, if I'm great, maybe it would have happened in you know in the time that it has been. But like, if I can also not fundraise and you know focus on the focus on the financier giving us the capital that we need. Um, and me just to focus 110% of my time on actually executing and operationalizing, like I get farther quicker. And so that's kind yeah. of, yeah. you know, what, what, what it ended up, you know, boiling down to. I think that comes down to the mission as well. Like your personal mission, reason why you started the company, why you're so grinding through it. And did, like, I remember I used to almost once a month, I would hate up or wake up just hating myself and what I was doing. I'm like, why, why the fuck are you putting yourself through this? Right. And everybody has to go through those rounds, like give yourself another, you know, few weeks or a few months just to run it through. Yeah. Um, and, and it's okay on either side of the spectrum. If you decide, okay, you know what? I want to sell this. I want to close this down. I want to keep pushing. And a lot of people, I think they get so bogged down with the pressure of making that decision where they're not able to see, you know, just like I said, past this, like, is this hurting my ego or is this for everybody involved? Yeah. And it's awesome. So round us out, you know, the last couple of years with Sutro, what, what's going on? Where are you headed? What other things are you working on these days? Yeah, man. Um, so we, 
spent a good part of the first, you know, few years in China. Actually, I spent like 30% of my first few years in Shenzhen, um, started learning Mandarin, you know, was, uh, building out the, um, the tools, visiting all the factories, you know, really, really building Sutro for like actual mass scale. Um, and then, you know, the last one or two years or three years since we launched, um, just been really heavily focused on marketing right now that the thing is out, it's like, how do you, how do you actually start scaling it? Um, and so, you know, just this year I've launched an initiative called Sutro Labs, um, which is going back to the basics again, right? It's taking our system and kind of OEMing it, right? How do you take the agricultural partner? How do you take the drinking water partner and deploy these technologies for the city of New York or for this or for Flint, Michigan? So we don't have that again, right? Going back to India and trying to figure out if there's any partnerships there. Um, so that's, that's kind of happening this year. It's, it's in its beginning stages, um, as we begin to grow. Um, I also opened up, um, or co co-invested in a, in a vegan taqueria actually just up the street here in Oakland. Um, so I've been kind of getting a little bit into just, you know, giving like locally back and trying to figure out kind of what I can do there. Um, but yeah, those are kind of like the, the two big things that I'm, uh, focusing my time on outside of actually advising um, our customer service company on how to basically build um, chat GPT for customer service, uh, but mostly on the back end. So not, I think this whole Turing test issue and like having bots on the, on the front level is, is really, is really annoying, right? Sometimes people just want to get back to an agent. We're flipping the model around to help agents that are, that are currently staffing these organizations to better utilize their time and answer tickets quickly. Um, so that's kind of a lot of what we're, uh, those are the three things I'm actively working on. That's a, um, I think the, the vegan restaurant I've been to, if you're in the area, definitely check it out. Um, I'm not vegetarian or vegan, but my friends are. They absolutely love it. Um, like, so I'd love to hear, because you, you also had uh, a stint in VC, not a stint. I mean, you had a, a Korean VC. Is that something which you're still kind of dabbling in as a personal investor or angel investor, or are you like involved with any other funds? I, I kind of invest in my friends' companies. Like I, I want to be the guy that my friends were to me very early on. And, and you know, obviously being in the Valley, I have a, I have like a ton of founder friends that are always working on stuff. So I wouldn't necessarily say I like actively manage a fund or I have one, but I do, you know, have some dollars to invest and in, and a lot of it goes to my friends and like helping, helping my friends start businesses. And, and as somebody who's gone through both sides, like which is more fun for you, being in the operations side or being the VC side? Oh, or man, I love the operations team. side. I, I I love like digging really, really deep and like figuring, you know, which is why I opened up the vegan restaurant, right? Like I could have kind of kind of went back and like, you know, maybe joined a fund as, as you know, as a GP or an associate again or something. But like, I I love digging my teeth into just like really interesting problems and, and figuring them. And I think that might be my engineering mind, right, at work. But like I... I like that a lot better than, you know, being a VC. So you, I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of, I mean, you, you have a huge network of friends uh, who are in the space as entrepreneurs, but I'm sure you get a lot of other random founders or startups reaching out to help. Can you kind of tell us, and we, we like to call this segment the ideal founder fit. Like if somebody who's listening to this episode decides like, hey, Ravi seems awesome. There's something that he said in this episode that resonates with me and they want to reach out to you. Like, can you kind of talk to us uh, through how you enjoy working with early stage companies and in what capacity? Yeah, I I really like helping early stage companies get from that zero to one, you know, spot. Like if you're if you're that founder that I was, you know, seven years ago where you're just stuck, like your your sensor that you thought you could buy off the shelf didn't work. Um, how do you get from that zero to one? Right. And then more importantly for like hardware companies in particular, I love helping them get to that manufacturing and scale standpoint. Um, Cause that in itself is a whole monster. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'd, I'd probably play in those two areas more from like an operational and like executional standpoint. Makes sense. And then um, you had mentioned, so uh, going back to Bolt uh, as somebody who's gone through an accelerator program, right? Because we do get a lot of uh, people who reach out asking like, are these, accelerated programs with it or are these fractional executives or advisors kind of worth it i'd love to hear your thoughts because you did mention that you utilized some previously but were those experiences positive negative or yeah you know what's funny is i i kind of went through a little bit of a 
you know, of, of, of like an oscillating, oscillating wave on that. When I first started at Bolt, I was kind of against the fractional side because I thought like I really needed somebody, you know, to be full time and really work on this. Um, and then I went and I hired full time. And actually what I do now is today we actually hire fractional people. Um, the problem wasn't with them. The problem was with me because I didn't know how to properly define the spec. And that's what the issue was. Like if you as a founder can define what the specification is for a fractional or a full-time person to come in, you're just going to get the job done better. Um, and so I think just me being so early on, being a novice, right? I like I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And so that's, I, I'm sure that rubbed off on the fractional people, which resulted in their work being, you know, shittier than it should have been. Um, and that's not their problem. It was mine. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. Because a lot of people will not look at themselves and be like, they're the problem. Uh, it's usually just projecting outward. Um, no, that, that, this has been absolutely amazing. Raj, any other questions or? My normal one. So, <laughs> Guy Raz, how I built this. Percentage-wise, what would you say hard work versus luck? Man, like 80, 80% luck, 70% luck, right? I think if you're, that doesn't change the fact that you shouldn't wake up every morning and grind, but a lot of what's fallen in my lap, what like shows up in my day to day is because you're at the right place at the right time. And you're just, I don't know if that's lucky or if that's a bit of perseverance too, but you need to put yourself in the room with the right people. Um, you know, a kind of good example of that point. COVID, COVID blew up our business in a good way because people were all forced to be at home, right? And when you're at home, your kids are there with you, you throw them in the pool because you just need to be at work with your computer. Would we have had as much of an upswing as we did in the last three years if COVID didn't happen? Like, no. Did it kill a lot of businesses? Yeah. Like there's there's people on the other side that was like, COVID was like the worst thing that could have happened to me. Um, and so it, is that luck or perseverance? I never could have planned or you know built for COVID, but it happened. And so does the grit then get you to pivot and move into a world where COVID is positive for you? 100%. Um, and so, yeah, I think I would say more than 50% is luck. Um, and then the rest of it's grit. Love it. And then um, one of the initial questions we were going to talk about was the imposter syndrome. Over time, how have you managed to deal with it and overcome it? I think you just realize that everybody is like an NPC in this world, right? Like you're, you're all, those are not, not, non, non playable characters in gaming lang language. Um, you, you're, you're always going to be an imposter to some sense, right? There's like, there's no way that you can ever like really realize that. And so the, the reason I'm, I'm being so stoic right now is because I just finished reading the uh, Almanac of Neville Ravikant and like, he talks about stoicism and just like being present. You know, I think the biggest way to encounter imposter, imposter syndrome is just, just be present. I know that sounds like really hoity-toity and stupid, but like if you just are in this environment, you understand the people that you're talking to and the knowledge that you have, you're just going to be better at the thing that you do. And if you forget about the fact of where you're not or where you should be, and this comes back to me being Indian and American, American Indian in India, you're just you where you are, right? Like there's, yeah. they're real, like, I'm not Indian I'm not, and I never will be. And so you just have to understand that. And then when you go there, you just, you just live Ravi in India and that's, that's who you're going to be. So there really is no imposter syndrome there. You're just, you're just who you are. Yeah, that's a, uh, fantastic insight. Ravi, thank you so much. We love to end most episodes with flowers. Like um, you've, uh, I mean, I followed your story along uh, since the beginning of the Sutro days and you've been super helpful with me. I've gone through a lot of like failed startups and, and a lot of trouble, but you've never been, um, uh, you, you've always been one of the first people who I can call up and just ask for, for advice, meet me in the city, um, you know, just hang out. And I feel like as, as a founder who is currently going through a rough patch, right? You need people with that external perspective who can kind of push you out of that, that mindset and just be like, listen, it's okay. I think it's thinking something else or have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And just, I want to say thank you. I appreciate what you did for me and um, hopefully I can return a favor in the future. Yeah, man. Anytime. Of course.
<laughs> well, with that being said, thank you so much, everybody. This wraps up our episode. But if you're looking for people like Ravi, um, uh, we have the Startup Studios Concierge, where we will take the time, myself, Raj, and XBC as, a, as an early stage founder and funder, who will understand what problem you're facing, and then to help you get matched with either somebody from our network or resources that we come across in our, you know, over 10 years of experience to be like, this is what, if you do this or talk to them, there might be an avenue that can get you out of there. So uh, definitely check that out. But otherwise, we'll be back again next week with another episode and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks again, Ravi. Thanks, Thanks Ravi.